All right, developing our understanding of the character and the nature of God. Heavenly Father, there's a growing awareness within us, Lord, that we, we need you more and more with each passing day as the forces of darkness try to swallow up the world, take over all of the kingdoms of the world. Lord, there's one kingdom that darkness cannot touch, and that's the kingdom of God. So Lord, we ask and pray that you would quicken us. Quicken us, Father God, in the things of you. Lord, there's a river of life that flows and there are times when we wander away from the river of life, but we need daily to drink of that living water every day because we can lose our way quite quickly. So Father, we thank you and praise you that you lead us and teach us and guide us by your spirit, by your word, and by your presence. We give you praise for that today, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. amen. And amen. Well, to continue on, we close off a message last week with a looking at the third servant from Matthew 25, highlighting the fact that because we ourselves don't yet fully perceive the Father's gracious nature in every situation we find ourselves in, and that still in unknown areas, as we've just been discussing, of our lives, we still live in some degree of fear. And this weakens us to some degree, disabling us and crippling us in our lives from obtaining all that Father God has for us. So we can clearly see here in this parable in Matthew 25 that the Master wishes to reward all three of these servants with the Father's heart being very available to all three of them. Also, if you can see it to us as well. If you haven't seen this yet in this parable, that the Lord Jesus Christ is highlighting for each and every one of us the need to increase our talents. Because this parable isn't just about money or mammon. It's also about our God-given talents, or if you will, the gifts of the Spirit that He has given to each and every one of us. With our using and thereby increasing them. So if then we take another look at these verses in Matthew 25, that, uh, verses 21 and 23. We're going to look at verses 21 and 23 of Matthew 25. What we see is that the Master commends both of his trustworthy servants. Commending his servant, the Master replied, You have done well and proving yourself to be my loyal and trustworthy servant. Because you were faithful to manage a small sum, now I will put you in charge of much, much more. You will experience the delight of your master, who will say to you, enter into the joy of your Lord. If we can see the heart of the Lord here, 
we can clearly see that the Lord wanted and wished to reward all three of his servants in the same way. And the joy that the master is referring to is the joy that the master himself received in blessing them. And by his rewarding his first two servants by increasing their influence in their individual administrations. Which, if we can see it, that this is exactly what the Lord wants to do with each and every one of the talents that he has given to each and every one of us. Or the abilities that he's given to each and every one of us. Now, this may not have spoken to you in this way yet. But we can see here that the master allowed each of these two faithful servants to keep their original gifts. While adding more to them for their faithfulness to him. Then we can actually see an opposing action from the master to that of the slothful servant by taking away his talent and giving it to the first servant in Matthew 25, 28. So we see that in actuality that the master had no intentions of taking back the talents or the gold pieces that he had entrusted into the servant's hands. As we say, in fact, we see that he increased them. He said to the two first servants, his first two servants, because you've been faithful stewards to manage your small sum, now I will put you in charge of much, much more. And you will experience the delight of your master who will say to you, enter into the joy of your Lord. Meaning, he wants us to participate in his joy. Think about that. The Lord wants us to participate in his joy. So with our able being able here to see the true heart condition of the Lord towards his servants, that it gave him great joy in promoting them and allowing them to keep the first gifts along with the gains that they had achieved. Now, if we can see this and take note here, because the victory in our lives will be proportional to how we see our God. We will get a clear understanding of this as we continue to grow in the Lord. You won't be able to see this as a newborn baby in Christ. The ability to see will grow as we grow in our knowledge and understanding of the Lord our God. I say this with great emphasis. That we have to see him as our Lord and our God. Without then being able to see the pure love that he has for each and every one of us, all three, he had a pure love that didn't falter or change for all of those three servants. And that of his delight in rewarding each one of us with more and more. So let's now turn, if you will, to Matthew 13. Matthew 13, and we look at verses 11 through 12. This is from the Passion Bible. My sweet Pete told me I have to slow down because I don't give you time to find the scriptures. It's very interesting what he has to say here in Matthew 13 verses 11 and 12.
Verse 11 starts off with, he explained, you've been given the intimate experience of insight into the hidden mysteries of the realm of heaven's kingdom. Just look at that line and let that sink in. But they have not. Who's they? Listen. For everyone who listens with an open heart will receive progressively more revelation until he has more than enough. But those who don't listen with an open, teachable heart, even the understanding that they think they have will be taken from them. So how we see then God, how we see Him, will either empower us or defeat us. And it will be proportional as to how we see God, just like the third servant. Now let's look at an important truth here that we see in Matthew 25 and 15. Matthew 25 and 15. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Matthew 25, we're going to look at verse 15. We, we just covered this very briefly this morning in our, in our conversations. Matthew 25 and verse 15. Before he, before who? The master, right? Before he, the master, left on his journey, he entrusted a bag of 5,000 gold coins to one of his servants, to, to another a bag of 2,000 gold coins, and to the third a bag of 1,000 gold coins. And this is important for us to see here each according to his ability to manage. See, we wonder sometimes why people get such revelation, and we don't. Ours is, in, you know, uh, little by little by little, which is a good way to have it, because then it can grow in you. But God won't give us more than we can manage. He won't give us more knowledge. He won't give us more revelation than we can manage. So what is this saying to us, body of Christ? What it's saying is that each one of us places a draw upon Father God according to our own abilities. It's important that we don't misinterpret that or misapply it because it all hinges on our ability to see Father God for who he is. Each one of us then places a draw upon God according to our own ability. To those then who cannot see that God is good, and there are many, they are unable to make a sustainable draw upon God because they are unable to draw any measure of the goodness of God into their own experiences. Turn with me now, if you will. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians, 2nd chapter, and the ninth verse. And I've chosen the Amplified the Bible of this verse, because I believe it says what I'm looking for in this message. First Corinthians 
It starts, starts off by saying, but on the contrary, as the scripture says, what eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and has not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared, made, and keeps ready for those who love him, who hold him in affectionate reverence, promptly obeying him and gratefully recognizing the benefits he has bestowed. See, we all make a draw upon God according to our ability and our abilities. Our ability and our abilities will grow as we receive more and more revelation from God about God. So let's take, take another look again then at Matthew 25, 30. Did you keep your duty there in Matthew 25? I did. Oh, oh good. I read it last time. <laughs> Now, the reason that we want to go back to this is because, now listen, while you're, while you're searching, listen. In our doctrines, in our doctrines of eternal conscious torment, we've come up with the concept that those who do not accept Jesus are going to burn in hell. Now, to those then who still hold to this view of Matthew 25, 30, it's mainly because through their lack of the revelation of God, oh, this just happens to be one of their favorite verses. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Now, if we can see what we've been talking about here the entire time, we're looking at these chapters, especially here in Matthew 25, 24, and 25, Matthew 25, 24, and 25, verses 24 and 25, we can see the perception of the, ser the third servant here of his master. If you start with verse 24, then the one who had been entrusted with 1,000 gold coins came to his master and said, Sir, I know that you are a hard man to please, and you are a shrewd and ruthless businessman who grows rich on the backs of others. I was afraid of you, so I went and hid your money and buried it in the ground, but here it is. Take it. It's yours. What his master is saying then is that in your fear, this is talking to the third servant, in your fear, you've influenced your actions and at the same time defamed me. Mm -hmm. You grow rich on the backs of others, he's telling yeah. the master. Yeah. So he defamed him. So what we see here, body of Christ, is the emergence of the character of the nature of God. Not with the third servant, although to some degree it is there, but it delighted the master not only to see that the first two servants profited from what he gave them, but that he also greatly delighted, it delighted him to give them more. Yeah. This is a celebrate with me. Yeah. Matthew 13, 11 and 12. We can see the joy of their master exuding from him. And he allows the first two servants, to, as we said, to keep the gold coins he gave them. And then he tells them, I will put you in charge of much, much more. And you will experience the delight of your master who will say to you, enter into the joy of the Lord, or your Lord. The master then says, throw the good-for-nothing servant far away from me into the outer darkness. Yeah. Now the term outer darkness simply means, listen, blindness. 
blindness, where there is total absence of light. Now we see from the book of Ecclesiastes that this book highlights the pain and the frustration that man produces by observing and meditating on the distortions and the iniquities pervading the world. So this speaks somewhat of the heart condition of the third servant whose fear comes from his observing and meditating on the distortions and iniquity that's pervading the world producing in him the third servant a totally disoriented picture of his master he said I see you are you know a ruthless businessman who grows rich on the backs of others that's the distortions, of, that's meditating on these distortions and the iniquity that per, is pervading the world. So it produced him a totally distorted picture of his master. Yes. The same process is still happening today and is still prevalent in mankind since the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden. But the last, or the ultimate, or the final Adam brought life and light to mankind, as we see if we turn to Romans 5. We're going to look at verses 18 and 19 of Romans 5. So the distortions and the iniquity that pervaded the world began there in the garden. So Romans 5 verses 18 and 19 read, In other words, just as condemnation came upon all people through one, tran through one transgression, so through one righteous act of Jesus' Jesus' sacrifice, the perfect righteousness that makes us right with God and leads us to a victorious life is now available to some. Oh. Oh. <laughs> All. One man's disobedience opened the door for all of humanity to become sinners, separated from God, that means. So also one man's obedience opened the door for many to be made perfectly right with God and acceptable to him. So now we mentioned Ecclesiastes, so now let's go there. We're going to look at chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 19 and 20. And 20. I think it only goes up to 19. Five. Five. five chapter 5. Five. Chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. 19 and 20. And it reads, Also, every man to whom God has given riches and possessions and the power to enjoy them and to accept his appointed lot and to rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God, of God to him. Verse 20, for he shall not much remember seriously the days of his life because God himself answers and corresponds to the joy of his heart. The tranquility of God is mirrored in him. 
we were just talking about this just before we started the message today of staying in the presence of God, staying in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And if we can do that, and when we do that, the tranquility of God is mirrored in us that people can see. So to highlight then the final condition of this third servant that we've been reading about in Matthew 25, once again, who incidentally has no knowledge of the character and nature of his master, is thrown into the outer darkness. Now some variations of the Bible, some versions of the Bible tell us here that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word gnashing means utter despair. So there will be utter despair. So really then, all that Matthew 25.30 is talking about is that when you or I, or anyone else for that matter, find ourselves living with the false, or with a false image of God, it means we're walking in blindness and in utter despair. And I'm sure many of us at one time or another have been there. So we can possibly all relate to this. Now the application given here to the outer darkness in Matthew 25, 30, to that of hell doesn't belong here. What this is actually saying here is that those who haven't rightly identified God's image or haven't as if yet rightly identified God's nature, that they will simply walk in darkness. So what this is reiterating here is what it tells us in Luke 11.34. Can turn with me to Luke eleven thirty four. Tell me to slow down if you're writing notes. Oh, it's all about perception. Luke 11.34 reads, The eye of your spirit allows revelation light to enter into your being. When your heart is open, the light floods in. But when your heart is hard and closed, the light cannot penetrate. Listen, mm -hmm. and darkness takes its place. So, if the eye of your heart is closed, everything you experience is going to exist and come from darkness. And darkness is the total absence of light, meaning that you'll have a total lack of revelation from God. And 100% of your stimulus, 100% of your stimulus in your life will come from the world and mammon, which is devoid of light. Mm. When you finish writing, I want you to turn to Matthew 6. 1924, because I want us to listen to these words. Matthew 6, verse 26? Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Isn't this good? I really like the way that Luke 
opened up. Yes. That verse is one I've always had difficulty with. Wow. Now listen to the words then from Matthew 6, verses 19 through 24. Don't keep hoarding for yourselves earthly treasures that can be stolen by thieves. Material wealth eventually rusts, decays, and loses its value. Instead, stockpile heavenly treasures for yourselves that cannot be stolen and will never rust, decay, or lose their value. For your heart will always pursue what you esteem as your treasure. The eye of your spirit allows revelation light to enter into your being. If your heart is unclouded, unclouded the light floods in. For if your eyes are focused on money, the light cannot penetrate, and darkness takes its place. How profound will be the darkness within you if the light of truth cannot enter? How could you worship two gods at the same time? You will have to hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot worship the true God while enslaved to the God of money. So as we look around the world today, we can see the people walking around in utter darkness for many, many years now. The teachings of God's character and nature have been absent and have been replaced by man's sheer greed for wealth and fame, with man being blinded in the pursuit of these things. And if you're blind, you cannot see the light. Not even the light of day. Amen? No, that's true. Far too many Christians are walking around in despair because we cannot perceive the character and nature of our Father God. We just don't know Him. Oh, we have an abstract picture of Him. But there's no light or life or transforming power in it. Now the definition of abstract is that of existing in thought or in an idea. You say that again? Yeah. Abstract? The definition of abstract is that of existing in thought or as an idea, but not having a physical or concrete existence. Or we could say that it's something theoretically or separately existing apart from something else. As in the case of, say, abstract science or religion separating them from their historical context will lead to them being made an anachronism or just a relic. So I'm truly hoping that we're beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel in bringing back to the forefront of our lives as Christians the character and the nature of God the Father. Amen. Amen. So, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed that and we'll pick up again next week. Amen. Amen.